an application of 25 signatures or more, a representative of those uh, positioners may have up to five minutes to speak to the committee, and I will give you the dark one minute before uh, that time is coming up. If the petitioner addresses the committee, then the applicant has the right and will be invited to the same with as five minutes and a minute's uh, early warning. However, if the petitioner has not addressed the committee, then the applicant will not be allowed to address the committee. A ward councillor can address the committee on behalf of residents, but once they return to the public arena, they take no more part within the debate. Um, the applicant, the application will then be opened up to debate and discussion by members of the planning committee, who will then make a decision on the application. The order of tonight's agenda may vary because we you know, obviously we try to accommodate those who are the most members of the public here. The committee will agree that before we start. If a site visit is requested and approved by committee, the matter will not be discussed tonight. No further discussion will take place and it will take place in a future planning committee, normally the next one. Uh, and members for that application, they can stay if they wish, uh, but I will inform you that in good time you, you go home and enjoy the rest of your evening. So that is effectively the uh, rules and regulations in which we, we go on there. Um, so, without further ado, we go into the committee proper. Uh, our committee inclined to approve the accuracy of the minutes on the 18th of October. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Number three, the second. Yeah. I'll form your sign those. Thank you. Uh, members, code of conduct and declarations of interest. Are there any? Councillor Davis. Just for clarity, please, uh, Steve. Um, in terms of item number nine, Bradfield Register, it was me that actually signed them all off. So I think it should make that point um, as I can remember for that position. I signed it off, and uh, I don't personally believe that I would be compromising anything tonight. But if anything came to the uh, planning committee, which is we were going to discuss, I would make a declaration of interest. Simply, I've sought advice from the, the, the solicitor in my role as magenta that are potentially within the brownfield uh, site item nine pieces of land that may be. Um, I've asked, is that remote enough for me to declare a personal interest and take part in the meeting? The column has given me that advice, so I'll go with that advice. If, if anyone thinks that's wrong, then shout up. Um, so, any other declarations of interest? No, we move on. Um, okay, are there any requests for site visits? Yes, David? Yes, sir. thank you very much, Chair. Item 6, which is 1 to 7 Lisa Road, Wallace Village, it has got a petition. There are some major impacts on parking, and I think that's going to only really be understood and appreciated if we have a site visit. So I would formally move for a site visit on item 6, agenda item 6, Lisa Road, Wallace Village. Thanks, Chair. Okay, are there any other requests for site visits? No? Okay, um, our committee agreed to have that as a site visit? Yes. That agreed, okay. The only other thing is to inform members, because it's only one site visit, we won't be having a mini bus in all of paraphernalia. Members are expected will be informed and make their way in there directly to that site. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I seconded that, yeah. I seconded the site visit. Okay, so again, those five and six, let's see they already. Listen to the instructions and I'll go and go on to watch the <laughs> okay. okay, so now, as I said earlier on, there are people here for various items, so my preferred pattern will be in terms of those applications before us will be five, four, and then eight. Does that make sense to people? So we go into application five, um, and we'll do we yeah, Matthew will do the presentation. Uh, this application was subject to a member's site visit on Tuesday, 
Planning Commission is for the erection of a new vicarage and an additional new dwelling either side of the existing vicarage, which is to be subdivided to create two new dwellings. The existing building is set in its own landscape grounds and consists of a two and a half story dwelling that has been used as a vicarage in association with St. Nicholas's Church on the opposite side of Grove Road. There is a mix of housing types in proximity to the site, including a complex of flats, bays water court, together with detached properties along road and road to the south of the site and bays water gardens to the north of the site. At the rear of the site to the east runs a railway line and a car park associated with Wallace and Grove Road Station. These proposals will see the existing vicarage subdivided to form two dwellings, which will appear as a pair of semi-detached dwellings, each with their own private rear gardens and possibly parking arrangements. Some single-storey flat roof extensions to the side and rear of the existing building will be removed, but overall the fabric and appearance of this building will remain unaltered. North of the existing vicarage, so uh, on this plan, it's this building here. Uh, and south of properties on Bayswater Gardens, a new detached two-storey, four-bedroom dwelling will be erected. The dwelling will have an integral garage together with space for two vehicles at the front of the property, and a private rear garden is also proposed. The subdivided form of vicarage, together with the new dwelling, will be served by a new vehicle access off Roblin Road, which will facilitate a shared drive for three new properties, allowing vehicles to park off road and also to turn and manoeuvre within the site so that they can exit the site and forward here. South of the existing vicarage, north of number 20 Grove and Road, a new vicarage will be erected. This building will be a, will be a two-storey, four-bedroom detached property with an integral garage and space for two vehicles to be parked off-road in front of the new dwelling. Access to this plot will be at the same location as the existing access to the vicarage via Grove and Road, and again, provision is made to allow vehicles to turn within the site and exit in the forward gearing. Private rear garden space is also provided for the new bridge. The design of new dwellings is traditional in appearance, using design and detailing that echoes the character of the existing vicarage. This ensures the development will not look incongruous in the street scene and complements the building, <coughs> the vicarage building, which, whilst not listed or within a conservation area, is recognised as being an attractive feature building in the street scene. Separation distances between the new dwellings within the site and having regards to their relationship with existing neighbouring properties are comfortably achieved, ensuring that issues of overlooking and loss of privacy are satisfactorily avoided. There are six small windows along the side, north facing elevation of 20 Grove and Road. So that's this property here, the six windows <coughs> along the boundary. <coughs> All of these windows relate to non-habitable rooms or spaces serving bathrooms, a utility room and a hallway. Therefore, only limited weight can be given to any potential impact on these windows in planning terms. While some trees will be removed to facilitate the new driveways and off-road parking arrangements, other trees around the site are to be retained. Bat boxes are proposed to be incorporated within the development as the existing vicarage is considered to have moderate flat roost potential. The proposals would retain an attractive and local distinctive building, ensuring its future use together with new dwellings which are considered to comply with the criteria set out in policy HS4 and the principles of the National Planning Policy Framework. The development is considered to be acceptable and is recommended for approval. There is a qualifying petition signed by 57 signatures. Okay, um, so there is a qualifying petition. Does the lead petitioner or a petitioner wish to address the committee? Yes, sir. Okay, um, I'll bring you forward and we have uh, five minutes. Uh, you can turn your mic on. You, you don't mind being filled, do you, sir? No. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, just take your name and address the record. Uh, my name is Michael Mangan. Shadow of a two-story building 
was taken away the majority of the way from that side of the property. And everyone was entitled to life. They also take away some of the privacy from the back of the We do have six windows on that side. Acceptable. 
um, as you must have seen um, on your um, site visit, it's um, an exceptionally pleasant area of Wallasey. Um, the vicarage is renowned um, for, its, for its development, for its beauty, um, as is the church, um, known as the Golfers Church, for, for those of you um, who may not be aware of that. Um, there's been um, obviously a petition um, submitted by the local residents and also there's been letters of objection of both myself and my Lord colleague Paul Hayes asked for it to be taken out of delegation so that um, clearly you could have the, um, the advantage of a site visit which we thank you for doing um, and also for it to come to full members to decide the fate. Um, as um, it says here, there's been a number of reasons why we would like the application to turn down. I realise some of them may not comply um, within planning, within uh, the legislation for planning issues, devaluation of the neighbour's property, and loss of the important historic character. However, um, what I would say is that um, in, in respect particularly of Mr. and Mrs. Mountain's property, there will be um, a dramatic decrease in the light um, which they at the moment enjoy down that side corridor. That side corridor, um, which um, was pointed out in the plans, which um, accesses all the rooms on, on the back and on the side of the property. Um, I think when the, uh, yourselves and the officer came out, um, you thought that all the windows along that side were actually uh, frosted glass. The six windows down there they're not all frosted. And that corridor, if you were to close the, the curtains or the blinds there now just to see how dark it, it is at present, if all those were closed, that will be what it's like permanently down that particular corridor. And the residents quite rightly, um, I think, are right to object to that. Um, just going on to uh, the issue of the, the trees there, uh, I have to say, um, again, um, Mr. Magnum may have alluded to it as well, but there, a number of trees have been cut down um, in June of this year. Not only cut down, they've been absolutely decimated. And I'm sure you will have seen that um, when, when you did your site visit. The whole of the privacy of that, um, the back garden of number 20, again, um, has gone, basically, the whole thing is, is open. So, I would ask you, um, when you're considering this, uh, clearly if you can take that into some consideration, the wall um, of the new, one of the new properties will be literally right outside um, those six windows, which the residents, as I say, are going to enjoy um, light coming into their property from there. So, um, um, as I say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no expert on planning. I've never sat on the planning committee, thank goodness, but I would hope that you could find some reason within um, your powers to actually refuse this application here tonight. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lenny. Um, is there any comments made that obviously want to respond to, particularly the ecology and the laws and issues like that? Or <coughs> going to debate that useful to, to, sorry, that useful to members first? Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, the, the trees on site are, are not good or weren't subject to any protection. Uh, the, there's no TPL on that site, and they don't fall within a, a conservation area, so they wouldn't have needed the permission of the council to, to further those trees. Um, we have on occasion to put conditions on that any tree felling shouldn't take place between um, the end of March, uh, at the beginning of March and the end of August, to avoid. Uh, nesting periods, uh, but as I said, because these trees are not protected, um, if, if there were any damage to, to nesting birds, and that, would, that would be something that is covered by separate legislation anyway, it was a wildlife, a wildlife act. Um, I think it's probably useful at this point if I can just um, explain uh, in some detail about the, these, these six windows along the boundary of, of 20 Grove Road. Uh, when we attended the site visit, on, on Tuesday. Um, I think um, we sort of stood in, in this location here and we could clearly see the first three windows as we looked down the, uh, the, the side elevation of number 20. And those three windows are um, obscurely glazed. Um, the three windows at the back, there was um, some uncertainty about that. So after the, the site visit had concluded on 
due to my <laughs> way back to visit the, the property. Um, the, the owners of that property very kindly gave me access to, to the house. So there are six windows. The first window is in relation to a, a, a toilet. The second window is in relation to a utility room. Um, there is a door in that, in that room as well. And um, that for recollection, the door has got clear glazing, um, not, not obscure glazing. The third window in is obscure glazed, and that is in relation to a, a, a bathroom. Then the three, um, the three windows that are down the, um, the, the back end of, of that elevation. Um, the middle one on the floor is in relation to a, a hall area. So there's a window on this elevation here, which is clear. It's not obscurely glazed. It's a small window. But on the opposite side of that, um, that part of the bungalow, there is a very large door that opens out onto the green patio. Um, so there is a secondary source of light into, into that part of the bungalow. And then there are two further windows um, down the elevation um, and they relate to a, a small narrow corridor that gives access to three bedrooms. There's a bedroom, bedroom at the end with a large um, east facing window that faces onto the, window, uh, onto the garden. So the primary source of light to the bedroom is from that window. And then there are two further uh, bedrooms that, from, that face onto the garden. One has got a window and another has got a, another very large window with a door that, that opens out onto the patio and the garden. So the bedrooms, which are classed as habitable rooms, have got their own um, source <coughs> of, of light uh, and they wouldn't be affected by, by this proposal. When I was inside the property um, with, the, uh, with the lady that owns it, we did close the, uh, uh, the shutters so that we could um, understand how uh, um, uh, you know, dark that, that corridor would be. And there, there's no doubt that the corridor would be darker. And as I said in my, in my presentation, we can only afford a very limited weight to those windows because they were linked to a corridor. Um, you, know, you wouldn't spend any considerable time um, in, in, in that corridor really to give access to the bedrooms that, that, that come off that corridor. So yes, um, undoubtedly there would be a reduction in light into, into that corridor. Um, <coughs> having said that, because they're not habitable rooms, um, and, and, and the, um, you know, those windows are already shaded because of the orientation of the sun throughout the day, uh, going from east to west around the south part of the site. Um, we, we've taken the view that um, the, the impact on those windows would not be sustainable um, in terms of a, a reason for refusal or, or can be obviously defended um, if it's ever to disappear. Um, so, so that gives members, I think, a, um, a, a more in-depth understanding of, of the windows on that location. Okay, so I'm going to open up to, to members for questions or comments. So, uh, Ian and David, and I'll make the comments, that's okay. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Uh, well, thank you to the uh, resident of number 20 and also the agents for this application. Uh, I'll begin, Joe, uh, so it's disappointing uh, to hear from the, uh, from the resident that there hasn't been sufficient consultation, uh, particularly by an organisation like the church, where clearly they rely on community <coughs> participation, that they can uh, undertake some exercise with the neighbours see what was and what wasn't acceptable prior to this application being drawn up. I think it's also regrettable uh, that when we look at issues on the planning committee, and our purpose is either to at least make life better, or if we can't make life better, at least to protect the quality of life for existing residents, and clearly as we heard from Mr Mangan and from Councillor Rennie, this application does not improve the quality of life for people living in number 20. Uh, Certainly in terms of the impact of the neighbours that the agent has referred to and that the officer has referred to, um, make, make reference to the six windows and the fact that the corridor, as, it's, as he's 
called it, a, a ballware, presumably in any other language. Uh, it's not occupied, therefore it's not a material issue. But the point of having six windows is presumably to let in light. That's why we have windows in buildings, and therefore to have six windows where light will be restricted because of the close proximity of the building to the south of the existing bridge, I think is regressible. Clearly, when we look at the site plan behind the chair, it is a considerable, considerably large site. Um, nobody could criticise the owners uh, for wanting to uh, maximise the use of the site for building and for development, but it's regrettable that the building to the south of the existing vicarage, the new vicarage as it's been called, is so close to the existing names of number 20, when there is so much land within the development that I think alternative plans could have been for them, as I said at the beginning, if there had been sufficient consultation with the neighbours. Uh, in conclusion, Chair, I think this particular development, while well, parts of it are clearly acceptable, <coughs> turning the vicarage into two units, there are no planning grounds to refuse that. The buildings in the north, I think there are no planning grounds to refuse that. But I am concerned at the building to the south, the new vicarage, and the close proximity to number 20, which I believe is unneighbouring and subject to what other members say this evening, Chair, I would be moving refusal on those grounds. Yes, thank you, Chair. Another occasion when the site visit was a most valuable way of taking an understanding of what was going on. The first questions I asked, <coughs> you may recall, uh, Steve, about the site visit were just separation distances. And it was quite clear that on the north side of the site we have very adequate and very proper separation distances, way in excess of what we would normally require. On the southern side, it's exactly the opposite. We have a building which is quite clearly, whichever way you look at it, it's going to cause a loss of light to neighbours. That is a fact, it's not conjecture, it's not opinion. It will be a loss of light to the neighbours. Just looking down the five reasons for objection that are quoted on page 20, just to clarify things for members of the public. The evaluation of the neighbouring property is not a planning issue. Loss of important historic character, that is debatable, but then again, we are providing here an excellent facility building itself, and what's being proposed, I think, are absolutely fine, nothing wrong with those at all. I don't think it's proposed overdevelopment of the site, what I would say is a pro, <coughs> not overdevelopment, but inappropriate development, because the area adjacent to the bungalow should have been not put there. The building should be further away, it should have been reorientated so it wasn't this awful impact on the life of the bungalow, the owners of the bungalow next door. Um, so my thoughts would be that irrespective, and I take one note to, as I always do with what the planning officers say, I agree it's a tenuous uh, situation, but to lose all the light on one side of that building, whether it be a corridor, whether it be rooms or whatever, I know from people I've known who've had this situation happen to them in the past, it is depressing to suddenly go into a dark corridor that possibly, for a time immemorial, they'll have to light most of the day before they can use it to get to the property. So I share with my board, with my colleague Ian Lewis concern brought out by the site visit and eloquently explained by uh, Matthew that loss of not light to the neighbours is a feature that I think would render this development being uh, unneighbourly in those terms. So I support in um, thinking that we ought to try and find a way of sending a message to the diocese that first of all they should have discussed this, they should have taken on board the thoughts of the bungalow owners and I would want to try and think of a method, mechanism for moving refusal on the ground purely of this being unneighbourly to the uh, occupants of number 20. So that's really my conclusion on the subject. Thank you. Uh, I did say I, I was going to comment uh, just to make it clear to people when we talk about separation distances, we talk about separation distances between those uh, the site and the habitable rooms. We don't, it's not always as, as succinct as, as you're saying, it's not to the boundary wall or to the fence, it's the habitable room. So, so we need to make that clear. Uh, my, my view is that site visit was very useful. And I think the constriction of the site is the fact that I think there's a general willingness, or my view is that the protection of the vicarage, which although not listed, has some architectural merit and has been protected in this application. In planning terms, I, I can say this quite freely, in planning terms, and I don't put ideas in developers' heads, there would be nothing to stop them demolishing that vicarage. There's no planning permission needed to demolish properties as we know. So that could be demolished and all sorts of development could go on, on that site. I think, uh, 
I would also encourage any applicant who comes to, to the will, we spend some time on pre-consultation. It is worth its weight in gold, I can assure you of that. Um, it, in all the applications we deal with, so to sort of counteract Ian's sort of line that we're only here to protect residents, we're here to enable development because planning law presumes approval unless demonstrable harm can be proved otherwise, and that's generally the, the term is. So I think the great efforts by um, the developer to protect the vicarage, the fact that the the vicarage has been protected, then obviously puts constraints on the site because there's a big building in the middle of it. So we've got positional issues in and around that. My view is that we've got to the end degree to look at the impact on the neighbouring property, particularly the bungalow. And when we were there, it was in shape, the sun does move around it in, in that sort of arc where we see on the site. There are times of day when it's in the impaired in shape. My view is that we also have to take into account the benefits that will be enjoyed by the occupants of the new properties when they, they move in, although it's not built yet, that is something that we need to consider. And we also are desperately in the need of numbers for housing for our local plan. So all in all, my view is that there's been a great effort made by the developer. We will never ever please everyone with, with some developments. My view is that on balance there are more pluses than minuses within this application. That would be my view uh, in terms of what and if any of the members have uh, comments, then uh, make them now, and then we'll obviously you have reasons for refusal to move. We'll vote on them. Should we move on to refusal first, yeah? Both. Yeah, yeah we, we need a formal way. Yeah, 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 I was invited to comments. Any other comments from us? No, okay. So, do you want to move to yeah. refusal? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to move refusal uh, on the grounds that the close proximity of the building to the south of the vicarage is unenabling for the existing residents of this, this particular development, and therefore we, re we reject the application and request that the applicant comes back having consulted with the existing neighbours. So, I'm sorry, but right, okay. And for that sake of advice, we can't move reasons to refuse and then instruct a developer. That's not a the reason for refusal is purely okay, that's what has to be helpful to the applicant chair yeah, because the applicant hasn't got the point by now that they should have been sort of neighbours out drop that sorry. The refusal. I'm sorry, but look, you just heard from the officer that in terms of appeal it would be dodgy at least. I want to make sure when we move reasons for refusal from this planning committee, we give whatever decision is made the best chance of survival at appeal. Yeah. I do not believe those comments are in any way related to planning issues, the second one. I would ask you just to move the actual reasons for refusal. Okay. I would move refusal on the grounds that the existing application, as submitted by the applicant, is unenabled to the existing residents of Brooklyn Road. That's far preferred to the Probably what we need to do. Yes, I second that, yes, and we need a close one. Okay, so we've got to move to the votes. All those in favour of those reasons for refusal, please show. Okay, so that means of refusal has been defeated. Uh, I will formally move, since I've made most of the comments, will move the approval and the conditions associated with it to the report. Has that got a second there? It's been seconded. All those in favour of approval, please show. And those against. Okay, so that's clearly been approved. Okay, thank you everyone for your contributions and your forbearance. Um, it's, we don't, it is a difficult job in funding Zoom, but uh, that's the one. Thing. Okay, so we can now move on to uh, so next item four. Shops and 
Additional objections to the original scheme was received from residents of Trenton Road West. While well, the amended scheme is subsequently removed the majority of banners on Trenton Road West from 13 to 4, with the only banners now proposed being directly opposite the stadium itself. It's therefore, consider that the objection contained within the petition has largely been overcome. Such banners are common features close to sports when used, and there are also examples of similar banners being used in other parts of Bacon Air. It's considered that the banners will add to the vibrancy of the area, enhancing the surroundings of the body zone and professional football club. Therefore, consider that the proposed scheme, as amended, will not have an adverse impact on the character of the area or the immediacy of near nearby residential properties. The application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to the tax conditions. Okay, I believe that qualifying, there is a qualifying petition, uh, although, yeah, okay. Do you wish to speak to the sir? Yes, please. Okay. <coughs> Uh, and give your name and address, and um, you've got five minutes. My name is Mr. General Helvey. I live in the city. Turn your mic off, please, sir. What? Turn your mic off. You won't be able to tell you otherwise. Okay. My name is General Helvey, and I live in 73 Britain, the West. I've lived there for 43 years. And in the 43 years I've lived there, Sandy Rogers has done nothing but try to disrupt the life of the residents in the Brenton of the West. Every time that something comes up, it gets knocked back. Then it goes in front of the committee again, and eventually it goes through. What we are objecting to is the distraction from motorists going down Brenton of the West. Since then, we've had an orthodontist in the Brenton of the West. We've got a, a dentist in Brenton of the West. The place is used like a highway, and it's just going to add to the confusion as the people going down the road and looking up at the barrier. Honestly, I, had, I spoke to a man called Godfrey Adams who's lived opposite Samuel Rogers for the last, him and his wife, 68 and 58 years, and they live right opposite Samuel Rogers. And the agony that they go through on a match day with people flying alcohol and all the rest of it is unreal. And after the match, I live halfway up Trenton of the West, and the jamming of the boards and glasses and all sorts is absolutely is unreal. People say, You're joking, we say, I'm not joking. It's trying to get who's kicking off again. But you know, we're residents, we're old people, we don't want to be hounded by hooligans who were climbing banners and still was in Liverpool, they've been burning them down and they've been pulling them down. So, you know, I, my, my argument is some year old was wasting their absolute time and their money. And Mark Palios, who seems to think that he can ride rough over the lot of us. I mean, you know, we're residents. And the, the banners are going on lampposts that belong to the council. And they're being maintained by the council. Imagine one of their banners going on fire on your lamppost. It's going to be hell to play, isn't it? You know, um, where did we go with regards to that? We have restrictions anyway, because on a match day, depending on which league you are in, depending on how many cars can actually park in the road. When they were in non-league, there was a non-police presence. Now they're in the league, they've got a police presence. And the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, I'm afraid. And you know, and this is why we, as the residents of Brenton North West, got this position up originally. We didn't know that the application had been dropped down to four. So we've come here blind not knowing that the application had been dropped down. Okay. Uh, we don't call me into that, but I was going to ask you that question. You are now aware that the number has been reduced in every moment of So, so yeah. you clearly do understand that. Have, have you finished, sir? Yeah, you know, I mean, what more can I say except banners, you know what I mean? That's all we're going to see. <laughs> Apparently, the noise that they make when it's windy is terrible. And, you know. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, is, the, sorry, is the applicant present to make a contribution? No applicants? Okay. Is there a ward councillor who wishes to make 
Any comment? There's a rule you have to sit on the committee, but that doesn't count in that sense. Okay. So, um, okay. So, any comments? The, the issue about um, them being set on fire, um, you have to be physical climate to go, go do that. We have them in other parts of the area. So has anyone reported that that is a common theme? Second question, maybe what to respond to the residents is about the noise and the wind issue, which I did raise in the briefing about the materials of construction. So if you could make some comments back to the resident, then we'll open up to people. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so in terms of the material, uh, it will be uh, it's a plastic PVC type material, and it, it will be fixed on two steel brackets to, to, to ensure that any noise from wind bottom is, is minimal, basically. It's open to members now to make comments. Uh, Pat? Yeah, thanks, sir. Just a question really on the noise issue. I've looked through the conditions, I don't see anything that actually addresses the potential for noise. I do have a personal experience of a noisy flagpole <laughs> banging away in the wind, but it, it can be very irritating. So I'm just wondering is there, and just really asking the question, is there anything we're missing in terms of conditions that could mitigate any noise problem? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, in terms of noise, there's two aspects. The first is, supposedly, the location of the signs, in that we've, we've removed them from where they were going to be right outside dwellings to, to more adjacent to the stadium, flying um, fields and shops. So that, that might minimise any, any noise. And secondly, I think from, our, from a high point of view, um, obviously they are councils and land posts, um, and before they get permission to, to put them on there, then they would need to, to uh, undertake structural surveys, um, but that wouldn't be through the planning process, and they would need to um, show a maintenance regime so that any did come once uh, through, through the highway, or the highway that would be then we would we'll have some come back to make sure that they're not left flat in the road, I suppose. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring uh, Sam across Thank you. 